All right, so I, I don't know what 20 minutes is going to be. I, I noticed, Pastor Shannon, we don't have a clock on the wall. That's a, probably a good thing. And uh, so we'll do the, do the best we can. So I'm, I'm talking to you today as a learner. And uh, this whole thing of goal setting and understanding the limitations of goal setting as well as the, the benefit, the, the means of grace that learning to set goals well can be. So I want to share with you some things that have been helpful to me and how I've thought about it. Uh, you'll probably need to do more research on, on your own and most of you, a lot of you here today know more about this, are more effective at me than this. I'm still, honestly, I'm still trying to figure that out. I'm not just saying this. I really, I'm still learning this, this year and how we're trying to do things where I am now at Mariners. Um, some of this stuff I'm trying for the first time. So just being in learning mode, uh, I learned many years ago in, in the conversation with Bo Gordy Stith. Are you here? Where's, yeah, he uh, introduced me to a book that I never read, but I just love the title. Um, and the whole idea, the fifth discipline of being a learning organization, that's a business thing. Well, we're, lear we're learners, we're disciples of Jesus. We never figure it out, we keep going. And, we're, and it's part of our sanctification, we, we still learn. So we're learning about goal setting. So, so, there, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, why bother? <laughs> it's easy to switch between two, two poles when it comes to goal setting, particularly when we're talking about your annual pastor's report because we get asked for goals uh, by our district superintendents and that can be like, oh man, this is one more thing I have to do and it doesn't have anything to do with what's really important. You can look at it that way. Um, that, that's probably not the most helpful way to look at it. But sometimes, and in, in whether you're doing church stuff or not, and I want to try to concentrate on pastor's goals and congregational goals each year because each year you have to do that for charge conference you have to do your pastor's report right we we are if you're in ch a pastor in charge or if you're appointed to a church as a pastor either as a CLM or a local pastor or an elder doesn't matter or even some deacons are 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 uh, appointed to a local church you're the pastor you are undertaking a ministry of word order and sir word order and sacrament they've added service i don't think that's really necessary but word order and sacrament goal setting for the for the church is part of your ministry of order you're helping to order the life of the church the buck stops with you it's your responsibility you don't do it alone but that's your thing so that's that's where we're locating this goal goal setting okay and but what you want to I won't try to avoid an idolatry of goals on the one hand, especially those who come from a business standpoint trying to take business and bring it into the church and learn from what business does and apply it to church. Just remember with this goal setting and all this stuff, utility, efficiency, even effectiveness to some extent are not the highest goals in the reign of God. A lot of your folks in your churches make that assumption uncritically. They just assume it. It's not. Now, on the other hand, um, there is such thing as a stewardship of time. Look at the parables that Jesus talked about. He talked a lot about the stewardship of time, the, the parable of the talents. How are you using what you've been given? Ephesians 5, the, the time, the days are evil. So we need to make uh, the best opportunities that we can of the, of the times that we're given. So goal setting can be a, a means of grace in, in using our times well. So that, that's, what the, that's what goals are. To really set goals well as a pastor, it, it's important to understand how things go together. They, there's, some things seem to be dichotomies, but they need to go together and not be pitted against one another. They're distinct. Your goals as a pastor are distinct from the goals of the congregation, but they need to go together. They need not to be in competition with each other. They're, they need to be in synergy with each other. There's lots of things like that. Um, some things in the Christian life are they're, they seem to be dichotomies, but they, they do go together. Relax and get busy. 
relax and get relax in the gospel. You know, Jesus paid it all. You're you're okay. You're you're accepted. You're loved, and get busy. <laughs> Because you're loved, then we get busy. So this is pastor's goals, church's goals. Each year, we, you know, we have to do that. And that's actually, actually a good thing, that we have to report on it. It should be, ideally, it would be something, oh, okay, I've already done it. I just need to submit it, not another task that, that gets done. Um, pray and plan. Strategic planning and prayer. Don't they seem like, don't they... they I don't have, I, I can't, I'm, I'm too spiritual to, to plan or, or I'm, too, I'm too planned out to, to pray. The, the two go together. They're distinct. But they need to, one needs to help the other. So strategic planning and prayer. Strategic planning needs to be done prayerfully. Um, and you need to pray in, in a strategic way. That they're all important. We'll get, look at that a little bit. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce a concept of two things that need to go together. Wildly important, the wildly important, and the whirlwind. Uh, and I'll explain what, what those things are in a moment. Okay, so the right goals, the right way, and the right reason. If you aim at nothing, you're sure to hit it. You ever heard that? <laughs> aim at nothing, you're sure to aim at everything, and you'll also hit nothing but you'll be really tired. So, so coming up with the, with the less is more effective goals uh, that are helpful to the congregation and consistent with what God is doing in our lives, that, that's who we're looking at. Um, this, this, is, this is my, uh, Reverend Kyung Hee is talking about SMART goals. I, I can only get three of those, S-A-M. <laughs> Simple, attainable, measurable. Uh, all goals need, need to be simple, attainable, measurable. Um, I like from X to Y by when. From X to Y by when. You, you identify where you are, where are you going to go, what, what it's going to look like when you get there. Um, and I'm adding by whom. This is, this is where pastors and, con and congregational goals fall short all the time. You get this great idea. We have this plan, and this is. It would be great if we do this. It'd be great if we do this. And it'd be great if we do this. Who's going to do it? <laughs> now, sometimes that works. See, this is the problem. As pastors, sometimes that works. You throw out a really good idea, and this is a, a prejudicial. I'm sorry. It's a generalization. It's not true in every time. But generally, with your older faithful members, if you as pastor just throw out a really good idea, some of those folks are going to make sure it gets done. Sure. And even beyond what you imagine, and there's there's a place for that, you know, in our preaching. You just throw out a good idea, and uh, my colleague Pastor Woody says, "Put put what do you put the flag up the yeah. flagpole and see who salutes." Yeah, so that's a way of leading your church, and and that's okay. But we need to do more. We need to have from X to Y by when, and who owns it? Who's gonna? Who owns that goal? And I, I won't want to ask you to concentrate on whatever it is you call it because there are official governing bodies and there are unofficial governing bodies. But whatever, the more you can make your official governing body actually the governing body, church council, administrative council, you know, administrative board, whatever you call it, um, that, that's really important. From X to Y by when. Uh, NASA, the classic example of a, a X to Y by when goal is uh, sometime, I guess, maybe in the early 60s or late 1950s. No, that was, he was president. So when John Kennedy said in a speech uh, that he uh, sort of challenged NASA to adopt the goal, we're going to take a, a, a man to the moon and bring him back safely by the end of the decade, as, as he said, by the end of the decade, from X, from Earth to the moon and back by the end of the decade, from X to Y by when. Uh, but the, the amazing thing is that it demonstrates the, the effectiveness and the beauty of an X from X to Y by when goal, but also the limitation. Because think about NASA. For, for like 10 years, it, they, they said if you worked at NASA, it, it, just, it just took the environment of that place and made it so positive. 
people wanted to come to work because they knew what they were doing, they knew why they were doing it, and, and it was really, really amazing. But then, of course, after, after we got a man to the moon and back, what, what's NASA doing now? You know, I'm, they, they do important things, but they had like 80 goals, and lofty ideas, and, and great things, and they were just sort of all over the place. But then when they had, we're going to send a man to the moon and back, then the whole organization focused on that, and, um, and they, they came up with three things that they needed to do, propulsion, navigation, and sustenance. And, and those, are, those are rather ethereal kinds of things, uh, but they figured out how to do that. So the other thing um, to understand is the difference between a lead measure and a lag measure. Different, uh, different books or different authors will describe these or call these different things, uh, but what I'm talking about is it's important for you to understand the difference between a lead measure and a lag measure. A lead measure, sometimes called a process goal, it's, it's, um, it's the stuff that you can do and, and is likely to evoke a response from people and it depends on the actions of a team. If, you're, if your team has a, a goal, uh, if our goal is to increase worship attendance, you know, go from an average worship attendance of X to an average worship attendance of Y by the end of the year. Uh, that, that's called a lag measure. It depends on the response of somebody who doesn't own the goal. In other words, you're trying to get the people to come, right? But what can the team do? Those are the lead measures. What can the team do? We can make 75 phone calls. We can send out 87 postcards. We can make three commercials or five announcements or knock on 87 doors. Those are lead measures. They are, and when you have a lag measure, this is where we want to go, then, but it depends on the response of somebody else. What the team can do, that's the lead measures. Right? Lead measures and lag measures need to go together. One of the places people fall down in their goal setting is they set lag measures and then they don't do lead measures. Or they do all lead measures. It's the, the people who sit around, you know your people who sit in a meeting, say, I don't care what we do, just do something. I, I'm sick of sitting around here talking about the little stuff and not doing anything. So let's just do, all right, let's do a bunch of lead measures that lead nowhere. And your lead measures and lag measures need to go together. So um, that, it, it's, it's important. So, so those, those and again, some of you know more about goals and the technicalities of it than I do, uh, but those are, those are important things. If you can remember simple, attainable, measurable from X to Y by when, and the difference between lead measures and lag measures when you're working with a group, it's, it's going to be really helpful. That's the science, okay? Um, now, the other, the other part of the science uh, and we'll get to the art of how do you apply this to church <laughs> in a moment. Uh, the right way. How do you take lofty ideas and translate them into tangible actions? That's the art of execution. Uh, uh, I, I rather think of it as implementation. Execution always makes me think of electric chairs and uh, other unpleasant <laughs> capital punishment. You know, that kind of, it's not, that's not what we're talking about, execution. But how do you actually... How do you take, how do you go from the lofty idea to a tangible action? Let me tell you, our Revelation 5 task force, for instance, this is one of the really difficult things. We have lofty ideas and, and visions, but how do we move from where we are now and influence people to move toward God's future? How do we, how do we translate these lofty ideas and visions into tangible actions? Uh, that's where the four disciplines of execution come in. Uh, Chris McChesney is one of the authors of, of the book, The Four Disciplines. And the four disciplines are focus on the wildly important, act on lead measures, keep a compelling scoreboard, and create, not created, but create, sorry, misprint there, create a cadence of accountability. If you can just get the first two, that's going to be really important. Ideally, 
The third and the fourth thing is going to be the agenda of your church council meeting every month. Uh, that would be ideal. We're trying to work toward that uh, at Mariners, for instance. But focus on the wildly important. Okay. Remember I mentioned a whirlwind? The whirlwind at, at church is all the stuff that, that happens that would probably go on even if you weren't there. And sometimes that's happened. You know what? You have a, at church you have a weekly whirlwind and uh, several different competing whirlwinds or they go around the same time. You, that whirlwind, you have a monthly whirlwind sometimes. A lot of churches have an annual whirlwind. One of, one of the things we do at churches is when you do something that is effective, that like is kind of successful, man, then we want to nationalize it. We want to do it every year. We want to annualize it. Our colleague uh, Alan Jones was once talking with his daughter Devin when Devin was little and they having this family event and, and she said, Dad, we have to do that. We, we have to do that again. And, and said, Dad, we do it every year. And Alan looked at Devin and said, Devin, how many years have we done that? He said, one. <laughs> but we do it every year. And that's what, what, what churches are like. And so we, we do those things and, and they, they just happen and they're good. It's not a, not a bad thing. It does become sort of hard to get your, your hands around because, again, this is a generalization in the smaller churches. Uh, part of the whirlwind is just dealing with the dysfunctions and kind of family feud types of things that people bring into the church where they, they just might not have a capacity at this time to really enter into, into a, a healthy community. And you're just trying to help things stay, stay afloat and not, not be totally overwhelming. And after a while, you're like, Ooh, what am I doing? So that's part of the, that's part of the whirlwind, too, in your, in your pastoral care. It's just, just trying to get that to go. It still happens in, in the medium-sized and larger churches, uh, uh, but it's, it's, there's uh, other whirlwinds. Um, you have the whirlwind also, because we are United Methodist pastors, you have the whirlwind that's associated with your own congregation and its culture. It's each variety it has its own, own culture. And then we have a district and conference level, uh, depending on how active that, that and And they kind of impose or encourage us to get into that. So, so the district uh, the superintendent asks us to do certain things or somebody from the conference um, as you go through the decades and you know these things come and go they wax and wane and there's this emphasis on this and and they say, every church needs to do this and so that gets added to your whirlwind that's already already there so that's the whirlwind all right and so you do not have to have and I would encourage you not to set goals about everything that your church is doing Everything you do as a church doesn't have to have a goal to it. Some, sometimes you just, we're not human doings, we're human beings. Sometimes you just got to just <laughs> let it go. The idea, the less is more, is discerning what are the one, two, or three most wildly important things our church needs to work on. Sometimes it's a problem, like it's something that needs to be fixed, it's a system that needs to be fixed. You know, the way we invite people or whatever, it, it, might, be, it might be the most, the wildly important thing we need to do is, is to, to fix the fellowship hall. You know, it might be a physical trustee kind of, kind of thing. This is where the, the prayer comes in. You have to discern, focus on the wildly important. Uh, they've done studies on this. If you have 10 goals, you most likely will accomplish none. If you have three, four goals, you might accomplish part of one or two. If you have one or two goals, you'll probably get them both. And so the thing is you still do the whirlwind, but what you do in the discipline of execution is at your regularly scheduled church council meeting, you have time set aside, what are we doing toward the wildly important goal? And um, I, I, I highly encourage the, you to get the book uh, the Four Disciplines of Execution 
It's very, uh, it's very practical in that way. So act on lead measures. Um, and, and again, keep a compelling scoreboard. The, the reason to do that is so that the lead measures and the lag measures go together. It's kind of, kind of theory. This is where I'm still trying to learn how to do this. You know, I, I, I use this thing about the, say your worship attendance is, you know, if you're tracking worship attendance on a, on a graph, put the, put the things that the other, that the members of the team are doing on the graph as well. So the lag measure is being um, a portion. Uh, ideally, for instance, for our capital campaign, uh, you know, everybody has a thermometer or whatever so you can track how, you know, how far is the furnace fund? You know, how far are we? You get the thermometer up. It would be ideal on that thermometer to also track phone calls made or the things that the, the team is doing. But that, so this is a little more difficult, I think, to implement in, in churches. But it, it is possible. But the fourth thing, create a cadence of accountability. Your monthly church council meeting, you've already got it set up. You have the cadence. So do it. It's almost like an annual conference. The, the schedule is the whirlwind, but every once in a while they have this the order of the day. You stop everything else and you do that. Now the reason you should only have one or two wildly important goals for any team or any committee or any group is that they can stop and focus on that one thing. All right. Um, so that's uh, goals in the right way. And this is probably the most important part, really. And that's um, applying this to, to church. It's like, how do we, um, how do we set goals as, as, as a church council? And um, I want to encourage you to model goal, goal setting. You know, and, and share with your folks what your goals are and, and how you're meeting them. And that, that helps. It, it helps them see how to set goals. It also helps you develop trust with, with them. If they see you say, I had a goal of doing this, and then I actually did it, they say, okay, did it. Well, but especially if it's like, I, I'm going to see uh, three shut-ins a week, and I actually did the three shut-ins a week, that increases their, it, it's like a deposit in your trust with them. And when you say, no, I think we ought to do this next, they're much more likely to go with you. So, so do that. Um, that's very important. Um, some random wisdom also is, uh, I think Mark Batterson said this, and, and I found it to be absolutely true. Churches overestimate what they can do in 18 to 24 months, especially six, six months. And forget a good idea. Say, we ought to be able to do this, this, and this. And you just don't, it doesn't happen. We're, we're a slow, we're tortoises as churches. We just, we got a pace. And we can't do things that quickly. But we underestimate what we can do in 10 years. Absolutely underestimate what we can do in 10 years. So that, that's kind of cool. Let me, um, how many of you, well for me, uh, some of the resources that have been most helpful have, have been the seven habits. Um, I, I, I went through that when I was in Smyrna, and, and it's really been very helpful to me. And I'm still learning it. Uh, Rick Horsey introduced that, that to me. Uh, so um, this circle of influence and circle of concern, are, are you familiar with that? Everybody has a circle where you actually have influence. And then there's this much wider circle that you're concerned about. And the more time you spend time and energy in your circle of influence, that tends to get bigger and bigger and bigger when you put your energy and time on where, where you can influence. And the more time you spend being concerned about stuff that you can't really influence, the less your influence is. But the, the part of the reason I talk about that is you have this, this uh, scripturally promised future. You know, that's Revelation 5. That's Isaiah 11. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. They will not destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. The knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's the scripturally promised future. And one of the things that uh, most of us as pastors 
uh, don't know about uh, is how to hear your congregation's story because your, your circle of influence is primarily here. These little wavy lines, um, the idea is this is where you're going, you know, you're going with your congregation to the scripturally promised future. This is, this is, this here is, it, it's, it's lofty idea, okay? It, it's, it's way out there. And one of the roles of a leader in the congregation is what uh, Will Mancini calls setting, helping the congregation have interim visions. They're, they're visions that they can see that are on the way to the scripturally promised future. Uh, but, but this is like how to get here and here. I don't see that, but I could see how to get here. And your measurable goals help them to see that this is where it's going. And when you can tie those things together, it's really, really important. Your congregation's story is its history. And I encourage you to listen to your congregation's history as they rehearse it and talk all about it. And help them to discern where in the, in the story God has been working. And, and identify some, something uh, and when I was at Asbury and Smyrna, it was their compassion. It was a very compassionate congregation. There was plenty of stuff that, that uh, you know, some, some of that history is, is overcoming train wrecks and all kinds of stuff. But, but what in that congregation's history is, is consistent with the gospel? How is God working? And that's, that's your A. From this, You have to start there. One of the mistakes sometimes we make is... Uh, we get caught all up in the story and we don't know how to go from here to there. So this is where you live, from here, here to there, and back and forth. But sometimes they, they call it, get, get the balcony view, right? You spend time in prayer and so you go over here and you get the big picture. And there's this rhythm where you go back and forth. And if this is where you are, you're over here, like the congregation's here, you're here, and you're really concentrated on that scripturally promised future, um, that, that's not always helpful. Because, you know, they're here, and, and this is sometimes where I've been, and, and they're, they're like, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're, what you're talking about. So I have to start here and go, go to these, these places. Uh, so there's a rhythm in our lives where you get the balcony view, the view from 30,000 feet. Um, and so I go here, but then I go back here and spend my time here. Spend a little time here, then I come back. And, and you go back and forth, back and forth. It might be three times a year that you go away and, and just spend, spend time. Now, I also want to encourage you, I'm talking about the church's goals and your pastor's goals, your pastor's goals. That, that's only one of your roles. Okay, you have other, other roles as well. So in that time away, you, I don't even think you should spend all of that thinking about this. But um, I encourage you to do that. Okay, um, the only other thing, let's see, there's one other thing I wanted to share with you. Well, yeah, we'll go for that. I, I did want to share you a story about preaching. There's one other thing. This is just me, okay? I, I encourage everybody in terms of learning and continuing to learn and continuing to learn, you should have a preaching goal every year. Mm. Don't ever think that you have arrived. Pre <laughs> if you've ever skied, snow skied, when you get to down the, the bunny slope and you get down that beginner hill, it's like you get it and you say, okay, I can do this. This, this is pretty good. And, and, and man, it was such a rude awakening when I went the, from the green dot to the blue square. And that, that's a whole nother level. When I went to St. John's uh, Church in Seaford, some of you remember, might know Harvey Kimbrough. He was the pastor of Parish Relations Committee chairperson. And after my first year, had the, uh, 
you know, the evaluation. So he was like sharing with me what, what the outcome was from their discussion was. And he basically said, we want you to, were they talking more about delivery or, you know, like what should I work, should I work on content, the delivery, what should I concentrate on and I work on this team? He said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so but that's, that's, a, that's a lofty thing, just to improve your preaching. Although, if you can train your staff parish relations team when they evaluate you to just give you something to work on. Just give me an area to work on. And then you can work on it. So that's a, it's somewhat fuzzy, you know, just improve your preaching. I was trying to get some specificity. But, so he just said, but he said, work on your delivery, work on your content. Okay. So what, what I ended up doing was, uh, this, you can tell how long ago it was, uh, I got a, a VHS, <laughs> you know, one of these, it's like a webinar uh, back in, in the 1990s style. And from William Williman, and, and every Friday afternoon for like a number of months, I just blocked off an hour to watch this thing and, and, and I learned, learned a lot. And I knew <clears throat> if anybody came by and said, why aren't you out visiting? I could say, well, the staff parish relations committee told me I need to work on this, so that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and, and, and I just did it. And I did two other things. Um, there was one guy on the staff parish relations team who was particularly um, critical. I mean, and he also was a great fan of my predecessor. Um, and, but I knew that there was something there, that it wasn't just, I mean, you can almost tell sometimes people are just, they're just out to get you because they, they hate you. But, but the, I think he was genuinely grieving not having my predecessor there. And I approached him and said, will you help me? I want you to write some observations down from, from my preaching when, you, when you're listening and, and just give me, and you and I will talk about it. And we did. And that was, that was very helpful because he was actually much more complimentary and encouraging uh, about a lot of things. And he pointed out some things that I wasn't really thinking about. So that was helpful. And the, the third thing is we did, uh, it's not always possible, we, we did a random survey with our congregation. We, we sent out every week 10 or 15 surveys. We'd usually get four or five back written, written things about the whole worship service. You know, it's like what was your, what did you experience? Anything was distracting? What was meaningful? But one of the questions there was uh, what was the sermon about? What percentage of, of the time were you actually engaged, or when, when was your mind going, and, and, and any, and let them write some stuff down. So, uh, over a period of time, you know, we got some, some comments, and, and there was, uh, there was a, something I was doing that I didn't realize that somebody pointed out. And I, I was able to take that and say, ask a couple other people, is, how, how does that come across to you? And I, I was able to assess it. So those kinds of things are really important, but part of the reason that you should, it, it's best to always work on, on your preaching is that sets up every, everything else. It's not the only thing, but if you're working on that and people see that you're working on that, then it just makes everything else go better because, it, again, that increases trust also, and um, I, I would encourage you to, to, to do that as one of your goals each year, to do something specific. Uh, whatever it is.